views from Muslims and non-Muslims alike. She spent time studying Islam with various teachers and now does her best to share the knowledge she has learned with others. So without further ado, everyone please give your undivided attention to Senator Mr. Perrin. Our Lord, enable us to be grateful for your favor which you bestowed upon us and upon our parents and admit us, Ya Rabb, with, you know, among the righteous of those whom you approve of and admit us with your mercy into the ranks of the righteous servants. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am very, very excited to be back again with you guys. MashaAllah, many familiar faces from my beloved NUI students that I taught many, many years ago. Well, not that many, I'm old, but not that old. <laughs> and many familiar faces from last year's conference and mashaAllah new faces. Alhamdulillah, I am extremely honored to be with you today with the youth of the Ummah, the upcoming generation that carries and will carry on, inshallah, the torch of this deen. Alhamdulillah, a new year is upon us, Rajab is upon us, a new day, a new chance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to try to work and bring forth the best of ourselves. And there's so many things I want to share with you today, right? And I know I have limited time, I know we're running late, I'm not giving up my 45 minutes, FYI, right? <laughs> So whether, inshallah, we talk about balancing between our deen and our dunya, or our spiritual well-being, or how to be proud and grounded in our Muslim identity, the purpose of our existence, and why you are doing what you are doing, what you're doing here on earth exactly, right? Now, I remember years ago, for, first of all, I do homeschool my kids. So I remember years ago when I started homeschooling, I was studying with my kids um, the book of Ghazali, the book of knowledge. And I remember the book started by saying how we all have not just one heart, but rather two hearts. And I remember the look on my kids' faces. They're like, okay, this is not promising. You know, maybe we shouldn't have had our mom homeschool us. Mom, we only have one heart. And I was like, yes, I know, that's true. We do have one physical heart that's visible to us, right? You go to an x-ray, you'll see just one heart, not two, that pumps our blood around and we take care of it by eating healthy, sleeping, exercising, and so on. But we do have another heart, right? Don't question me like my kids did. It's an invisible heart, right? It's an invisible heart that needs a whole lot of work. And that is our spiritual heart. So many times our focus is on maintaining our physical hearts, what we eat, how we exercise, socializing, giving it everything that it needs and more so what it desires, right? And I'm gonna stress on what it desires here. But along the way what happens is that as we are fulfilling these needs, we are suppressing the needs of our spiritual hearts. And there's this feeling of dissatisfaction no matter how hard we try to maintain our physical hearts and do all these things, we always feel that something is lacking. Something is off. And this is because without having a healthy balance between the two, there is no way, there is no way we can be well-balanced human beings. It's just not doable. Oops, I'm sorry about that. You cannot tend to one and ignore the other and expect a pleasing outcome in any way, shape, or form. Now, I'm not going to talk today about physical hearts, right, or the details of how to maintain that. I'm sure you guys 
you know, all into what kind of exercises you do, what kind of diets you follow, and what not. My main focus today will be our spiritual hearts. How are we going to maintain our spiritual well-being through nurturing our spiritual hearts? What do we do to feed our spiritual hearts? How are we going to keep it in a constant state of growth? Because we need to be always growing, always learning something new. That's what a Muslim should be doing. How do we keep it well balanced and keep it in a healthy state just as we try so hard to keep our minds and our bodies health healthy? So the first question we all have to ask ourselves is, what is the main sustenance of a spiritual heart? Like, what is the main thing that it feeds off, right? And it doesn't really need much thinking, right? It comes down to what the Qur'an and the Sunnah of our beloved Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, don't be misers. <laughs> there are so many doors of good and khair in our deen that you can help, or that can help you, sorry, sustain to maintain that spiritual heart. And every single one of us here in this room, everybody in general, is good at something, perhaps not as much as the other. And that's why the doors for doing good are so many and so diverse, so that you can enter through the door that you are good at. Some of us are great at servitude and doing charity. Others, Allahumma barik, 2 a.m., the alarm goes off, they're up for qiyam, right? You're not dragging yourself out. Some of us are amazing at qiyam. Others at fasting, others at acknowledging his mercy, seeing blessings as blessings, or, you know, psalm, or whatever it is, or certainty, or yaqeen, or forgiveness, or restraining your anger. So many things you can feed your spiritual heart off, right? And each one of us excels at one thing more than the other. Each one of us, has a stronger muscle on one side of our spiritual hearts more than the other side because we all enter through different doors. And I know for certain that each one of you right now sitting here, because I know, you know what you're good at. You know which door you keep coming through to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Do you know what you're good at or no? You can answer me, it's okay. You guys know, right? Whether you're, mashallah, really good with your, you know, maybe, I know, Salat al-Rahim, keeping family ties, or Psalm, or Salah. Each one of you has something that they're good at. And it's very important that you know the strength and to kind of keep coming through that door to get, you know, to attain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is also very important to switch things around every once in a while. And to try to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through different doors, if not all of them. Even if you try a specific sunnah, just for once in your life, right? Just with the intention that you want to emulate something the Prophet ﷺ did. Even if you're not good at doing it all the time. We should all have that keenness of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu arda. When he heard the Prophet ﷺ saying, anyone who spends a pair of anything in the cause of Allah or in the way of Allah, he will be called from all the gates of Jannah. O oh, servant of Allah, this is good, right? The people of prayer will be called from the door of prayer or the gate of prayer. The people of jihad will be called from the gate of jihad. The people of fasting will be called from the gate of arayyan. And the people of charity will be called from the gate of charity. Now Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq says, one who is called from all these gates will not need anything. And then he asks, Ya Rasulullah, Will anyone be called from all these gates? And he وسلم, says, Yes, Ya Abu Bakr, and I pray that you are one of them. So today we want to have that himma, right? That desire and that ambition that's deeply rooted in our souls to emulate the himma of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. Try different things. Try to enter through different doors to renew that form of connection with your khaliq, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this brings me to the second point that I want to talk about. Ask yourself, why am I trying to strengthen that spiritual heart? Right? Why am I trying to ground myself deeply into my faith and have that strong and sturdy bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger and have that strong conviction? And you'll find the answer to this is the very purpose of your creation. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I did not create the jinns, 
and the human, mankind or the humans, except for the purpose that they worship me. That is the main purpose of your existence, to worship your khalaq. Your purpose in this world, why you exist, is not because you have to get that PhD, or to buy that mansion, or to drive that specific car, or I don't know what. And don't go tell your parents, Sister Yusra said, I don't have to do any of that. I didn't say that. Wait on, hold on. I'm not saying this so that you neglect your world or your responsibilities. On the contrary, set your goals, get your masters, your PhDs, be knowledgeable, be well-rounded. Inshallah, you know, and have that nice car and that nice spouse and family, everything. These are all great blessings, na'am, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're great to have. But you should never allow these things to slide into the slot of the purpose of your existence. You should never allow these goals to slide into the slot of the purpose of your existence. We are here on earth so that we can work our way back home to Jannah. I'll repeat that again. We are here on earth so that we can work our way back home to Jannah. We work, we exert the effort, we strive, we exhaust all the means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated for us. And along the way, if that nice house comes, alhamdulillah, the fancy car comes, alhamdulillah, that great spouse, alhamdulillah, that's great. But that's not what is going to define you. It's not the scale for your success and your failure. It's not how we evaluate our self-worth. It's not. Your success should not be defined by attaining things in this world. Your success is defined by your success with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I used to teach at NUI. Where are my NUIers? Put your hand up. Yes, you go. Look at that. They're all in the back there. I don't know if you guys remember this, right? But I used to tell you, it doesn't mean anything to me if you get an A plus in all your subjects, but you're failing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't mean anything. Success is when you get that A plus with your khalaq, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this brings me back again to the purpose of our existence. To worship, to be his khulafa, his vicegerents on this earth. And I know when I say worship, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Salah, song, qiyam, right? Physical form of worship. And if we stop and we think just for one minute, if this ayah, right, that we just said that we were only created to worship, means physical worship, then we should be on the prayer mat what? 24 7, right or wrong? If we're only created to worship in subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, time of truth. If we look at the actual time we spend praying every day 15 minutes, 20, 25, I'm going to say 30, all right? I know that's not half, that's not half, but I'm going to say 30 minutes a day of salah, right? So, average of six minutes per salah. So, if you think about it, 30 minutes out of 24 hours. 24 hours is 1,440 minutes. I did not calculate that because I'm not a math genius. I calculated before I came. So if you're praying 30 minutes out of 1,440 minutes, um, are we actually then fulfilling our purpose? I did not create jinn and mankind except for the purpose to worship me. If that's what it means, then we are all in serious trouble. Even the most pious of us, right? Even the Zahid, someone who gave up everything for the sake of Allah, they're not up 24-7 in worship, right? So here we come to understand that the worshiping is not only physical ibadah, right? Or else, as I said, we would be in trouble. There's at least a good six to eight hours of sleep. I'm not talking about the people who sleep 11, 12 hours. I'm not gonna mention anyone. Add that to the time that you study, you commute, you shower, you eat, you socialize, you see your parents. So in order to be able to explain this verse, I am going to share with you a hadith that you all know inside out. But this hadith is a game changer. I want you to write it down if you can. You know it, but I want you to remember this hadith. And Imam al-Shafi'i says this hadith is a third of Islam. And it's the first hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. You all know the hadith, I'm gonna say it, but you know it, and I want you to remember it. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab says that Sayyidina Muhammad said 
Verily, actions are by their intentions, and for every person is what he intended. So the one whose hijrah was to Allah and his messenger, then his hijrah was for Allah and his messenger. And the one whose hijrah was for the world to gain from it, or for a woman to marry her, then his hijrah was what he made his hijrah for. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِ مَا نَعْمُ Right? فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ Actually, for that, مَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُسِبْهَا أَوْ مَرَأَةٌ يَنْكَحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ الْمَيْدِ This hadith explains the previous verse. I'll tell you how. We just said that our physical worshiping is 30 minutes, give or take, hoping it's more, very little time. So is it possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us because he wants us to worship 24-7? It can't be because he also says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, ja'ala It is he who made the earth tame for you. So walk among its slopes. Allah is telling you, go into the earth, walk among its slopes, and eat of its provision. And to him is the res resurrection. And he also says, he tells you, and when the prayer has been what concluded, disperse within the land and seek from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember Allah often so that you may succeed. And he is also the one who said, خيركم خيركم The best of you are those who are best to their families. And he also commanded you, if you're able to marry, to get married. So how can I only be created to worship? And at this point, you know, how can I translate or how can I understand this ayah? This is where this hadith comes in. Worship doesn't mean that you're going to neglect everything, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and entrusted you upon and just pray and fast, right? Worshiping here means you're going to go ahead with your life. Of course, being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, but you know, you're going to work, you're going to study, you're going to have a family, you're going to succeed, you're going to go out, you'll socialize, you'll do all these things, but you will add a little secret ingredient to make it count as worship. So pay attention here, because this is the secret ingredient you want to go home with, right? To keep you connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through every little action that you will take. What is the secret in ingredient that we have here? To take a niyyah, an intention, for every little thing that you do. I want to please you, Ya Allah. That's my idea. In everything that I'm going to do. So the verse now, right, that I did not create jinn and mankind except to worship becomes what? Soothing. Alhamdulillah. This is not what Allah is requiring from me exactly. I'm going to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the verse and the hadith together. Basically, I am worshiping, worshiping you, Ya Rabb, through this action that I'm doing. I am worshiping you through the action that I'm doing, even though it's not Salah. And I'm going to give you examples. I'm going to give you very simple examples because I know at the end of the day we sit and we you know, share beautiful hadiths and ayahs and whatnot, but at the end we don't know sometimes how to kind of translate them into an action plan. And it's very important that you walk out with an action plan. You should always have a plan as a Muslim. What is my next step? What am I doing? Let's look at this. Inshallah, you guys will graduate. Some of you may be already working or will be working soon. So I'm going to ask you, what is your intention for work? You tell me, what do you mean? You know, people graduate, right? They get a good you know, degree and they go and work because people work. They have to pay bills. That's what people do. So did I fulfill accept worship here? No, you worked. You didn't do anything bad. It's good to work, right? But how about illa li abdun? Accept worship. So let's add an intention. I am going to work really hard, Ya Rabbi, to show the example of what a successful Muslim is. I will show people that you can be religious, yet you're hardworking, you have integrity, you're honest, you're pleasant to be around. When I do something, I will strive for excellence in it. Ihsan, no half-done jobs. I am going to leave people questioning, why is he or she the way they are? I am going to be a compass. When people look at me, whether they're from my same faith or not, they're going to be directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Wow. Look at that Leah. Isn't that amazing, Leah? At this point, you have fulfilled the Abaddon to worship. You're still going to your same job from nine to five. You're still punching in, punching out. You still have the same job, the same coworkers, the same filing, the same emails you're sending, but this time you are living with intent. You are living with purpose. You have a higher vision. Do you understand why this hadith is so important? Yes? Okay. The hadith says the reward of deeds, right? And amal, the deeds, depends on the intentions. The Prophet ﷺ said deeds because it's all your amen, all your actions, every little single one of them. Whether you're working, sleeping, eating, whatever it is that you're doing, right? So it's up to you to decide whether you want what you're doing to count or not. With this hadith, the niyyah, you can transform into a full-time abid, a full-time worship or abida. And yet you're still doing exactly what you're doing every single day. You're still waking up, you know, going to school, studying, going home, meeting your friends, but you're doing it with purpose, with intent. There's a connection and your life becomes way more meaningful. Let's think of another intention for work. I'm trying, you know, to just give you examples and I, what I want you guys to do today, inshallah, after you go home or when you have a break, sit down and list some intentions that you can add to your day. You know what you do every day, who you interact with, who needs what, right, from you, and how you can help. Set a list of intentions, live with purpose. Be a person who lives meaningfully, not just living like that. So another intention could be, I will work to make money, right, maybe help my parents, help my grandparents, pay off my tuition, help someone who's in need, give back to my community. SubhanAllah, this is why the scholars said that this hadith is a third of Islam. Ask yourself before you do anything, why am I going to do what I'm about, I'm about to do? Right? Inshallah, you guys, you know, at the age of getting married, inshallah, beautiful sisters, beautiful brothers, I'm not saying anything, just giving an idea out there. It's all halal. Right? Inshallah, Allah blesses you with beautiful children. And usually when you ask people, like, why do you want to have a child? What do you mean? I want to fulfill my parenthood needs. I want to fulfill my motherhood, my fatherhood. I want someone to carry on my name. And these are all beautiful things, and they're mubah, permissible. But where is illa li abudun except to worship? Then what can my intention be here? Right? How am I going to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amidst raising a child? I'm not going to describe the child anything more than a child. They are cute when they're sleeping. Yeah, they yes. Yeah. True. True, yes. So, I want to have a child, Ya Rab, that is going to be a true bearer of this torch of Islam. Someone who's going to bring good to this dunya. Someone who's going to change how people look at Islam and at Muslims. Right? Now, let's compare the initial intent, which is perfectly fine again, as I said, with this one. At this point, Every little crying and diaper changing and you guys are in for a ride if you don't have a child yet, I'm just letting you know. It's fun, it's rewarding, right? And the waking up in the middle of the night and the lack of sleep and the doctors and the fever and tantrums and then, mind you, when they get to teenage years, God bless us all. If you have a teenager, you know. The hormones, you're going to be in a roller coaster ride or in a bedtime story, they're dropping up and picking up. Every single little action becomes rewarded for it. SubhanAllah, it's all in the scale of your good deeds. You're still raising a child, you're still fulfilling, you know, parenthood needs and having someone carrying your name, but it's very different, right? It's very different. We keep complaining that the youth is drifting away. Okay, my intention is to change that reality. I'm going to bring our bad into this dunya. Well-rounded, educated Muslims, that's what I'm going to do, inshallah, with his will and power, of course. This is such a beautiful religion, Wallahi, and this hadith is so serious and Allah is so generous. Allah is telling you live the way you're living. Of course, be mindful again of Allah, but I will reward you for everything that you're doing. Everything that you do just to live, to survive. Everything you're going to get rewarded for. And subhanAllah, sometimes I think to myself, like, how can shaitan trick us into not doing this little act? You know, you don't even have to move a single muscle to take an intention. Your mouth doesn't have to move. And niyya mahallu al qalb. It's in your heart. You're just like, take an intention. How could we let him get away by tricking us to not put an intention for everything that we do? Before you move, ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? 
Another one, you work out. How many of you guys work out? Yes, beautiful. You want those nice big muscles, right? No, but seriously, which is fine. You should be working out and exercising, right? And then there are people going on keto and people doing Atkins and intermittent fasting. And the last one, I don't know if you guys heard about the water fasting? Anybody hear about water fasting? Good, you shouldn't. It's like you go for like four or five days, all you do is drink water. And I'm like, no thank you. When that amount goes up, I want my machi to dig in. And then, you know, thank you very much, I'll stick to that. But water fasting is a huge thing right now. And it's okay to take care of yourself, but let's put an intention. I want to work out, I want to be healthier, right? So I can work better, study better, serve better my community, right? I want to have a good, you know, good health. Allah has entrusted me upon my body and he is going to ask me, what have I done with it? It's an amana, right? And we all know the story of Salman, when he told him, you owe your body what you know, he writes. So, work out with an intention. I want to be strong. I want to be, you know, be able to study and work and have good health and you know, not be ill or have, any, you know, have to depend on someone, all these things. The last thing, for example, if you are studying, hopefully you're all studying, right? Now, when we study, what is your intention? Because I want to get those high grades or else mom and dad get into action mode. Arabs in the room here, you know what I'm talking about, right? Things flying in there, I'm not going to say what, but you know. And then, or you want to, you know, study because you just want to graduate. You want to just get over and done with it. Or because you want to be called doctor so-and-so or, you know, professor so-and-so. And it's okay. But I want you to listen to this intention. I want you to write this one down as well, please. Look at this one. مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَبْتَغِي فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ What does this mean? Whoever embarks a path seeking knowledge, like your beautiful selves here today, right? And as you're studying every day, Allah will facilitate sorry, Allah will facilitate for you a path to Jannah. Whoever embarks on a path seeking knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate for him a path to Jannah. Huge difference dodging those flying ship ships or a path to Jannah, come on. Huge difference, study with intent. At this point, every minute you're sitting studying, those stressful days before exams and lack of sleep at night and attending and this and that, every single minute of it is counted for you as a reward, inshallah. Do you see how that verse is kind of falling into place now? Illa liyahudun. Now, you are not required to be on the prayer mat 24-7. Yes, pray a lot and get up in the middle of the night and ask Allah and, you know, be close to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you also have to live with intent. You have to have intentions, big intentions, big goals, just the ones you have in your life. You want to do this and you want to do that and you want to achieve this by this age. How about your Jannah goals, right? You have to be a person of intent. Sittina Asma radiallahu anhu wardaha used to say, Inni la ahtasibu nawmati kama ahtasibu aklati. I make an intention for my sleep just as I make an intention for my eating. She knows she has a hard day work the next morning and she wants to be rewarded for it. For things that she does, not just because she wants to do it, but things that you do to survive. Like eating and sleeping. You have to eat and sleep to survive, right? Take a niya. I'm sleeping it up with intent so I can wake up and catch those two, you know, rakahs in the middle of the night with kushua. Or I can, I can wake up refreshed on time or go to work refreshed with my intentions that we spoke about. Every deed is based on its intention. And as if the Prophet ﷺ is telling you, the value of your deeds is not by their size or magnitude. It's not how big of a thing you did or how little, but it's by your intention. The value is in the intention. And Ibn al-Kathir says, The intention of the believer is more valuable than the action itself. I did such and such. What was your intention? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man kana yuridul ajila ajilna lahu fiha. You want dunya? We will give you dunya. Go ahead. We'll give it to you. That's for the one who wants dunya. And then he subhanahu wa ta'ala continues saying, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ 
As for the one who wants the hereafter and exerted effort, you see that? You want the akhirah, but you're exerting effort in the dunya to reach the while he's a believer? It is those whose efforts are ever appreciated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the following part of the verse is really important. He says what? Allah says, I'm going to give. I'm going to extend to this one and to that one. They will both take at the end, the one who wanted the dunya and the akhirah, because they both exerted effort, but with the intention, they ended up in very different places. This one worked with an intention, and the other one didn't. And sometimes we even think to ourselves, you know, do we even have an intention? And I remember this happened to me in early 2000s. I had a friend of mine, Rahmatullah in dua, very sweet girl, and she used to always be walking around carrying this binder. And you know how there's like a um, see-through pouch in the front? And she had something like a drawing she had put in there, and it was written on it, وَقَدْ قِيْلُ And it was said. And I'm like, what does this mean, Dua? Like, what does it mean? And then she shared with me this hadith that kind of like set me straight. I'm going to share it with you guys. Very powerful hadith. And she said, I, I heard this hadith and I wanted to just remind myself, why am I doing what I'm doing? Verily, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, the first people to be judged on the day of judgment or the day of re resurrection will be a man who was martyred. He will be brought the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be made known to him and he will acknowledge them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him about them. The man will say, Ya Rabb, I fought in your cause and until I died and I was martyred. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, you have lied. You fought and were killed so people would call you brave. And it was said, وَقَدْ قِيلْ And then Allah commands that he be dragged on his face to hellfire. Another man comes who studied religious studies, knowledge, taught others, the Qur'an. He will be brought and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be made known to him. And he will acknowledge them and he'll say, you know, Allah will ask him, what did you do about this ability to have knowledge? And the man will say, Ya Rabb, I learned religious knowledge, I taught others, I recited the Qur'an, and I taught it for your sake. And Allah will say, you have lied. You did that so you would be called knowledgeable. You're a scholar, you're a reciter, you're a hafid. وَقَدْ قِيلْ And it was said. And then Allah commands that he be dragged on his face to Malfire and Ayyad Allah. And the last man comes, and he was one of the most wealthiest. Allah gave him so much. And the blessings of Allah will be made known to him and he will acknowledge them and Allah will ask him, what did you do with these blessings? And he will say, Ya Rabb, I did not leave a single cause that was beloved to you unless I spent in it. And Allah will say, you have lied. You have lied. You only did this so people would call you generous. And he gives. وَقَدْ And it was said. Ya Allah, that, that, that hadith of Allah scares me till this day. Ask yourselves, are my intentions bringing me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or pushing me away further? Or am I just living just like that, without any intent? Like I'm just heedless, ghafla. And I pray Ya Rabbi, we're not from those people because Allah says about them, هم خل أنعام بل هم أضر سبيلا They're like cattle, or even more, straying and confused. Just wake up, you eat, you go to school, go to work, come back. You see, you don't know why you exist living without purpose. And you cannot live without purpose. You have to have a vision. You're Muslims. You have to have a vision. That's the worst of creation. And we do not want to be in that category ever, inshallah. Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, people will be gathered upon their intentions. I want to leave, or I want you to leave today, being like as, you know, being like the companions used to be. To God me yet, or to John me yet. They're merchants of intentions. They don't take just one intent, but multiple intentions. And it's said that the ulama, to John, or the John me yet, the John the ulama. The trade of intentions is the trade of scholars. Because if you think about it, mubah, or what's permissible is the majority of our life, right? We're allowed to eat, we're allowed to go out, we're allowed to sleep, to marry, to work. It's mubah. But with a little bit of smart, you can flip this mubah, right, into what acts of good deeds, things that can count for you, right? 
basically تحويل العادات إلى عبادات changing your daily actions or your habits into acts of worship and I want to touch briefly on the outcome or the impact of taking an intention on your heart when you do things with purpose one of my favorite sayings that I love but it also scares me right your reaction is a reflection of your own heart yes many times I think of myself like with my kids sometimes right your reaction is a reflection of your own heart it's not because of what the person in front of you did but rather it's because of what you have allowed into your heart now imagine if your reactions are reflections of what's in your heart and imagine if we are beefing up our hearts with intentions of nothing other than to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what kind of reactions will we have what kind of outcome will we see Wallahi, you will see nothing other than barakah and beauty and blessings and acceptance and serenity because you filled your heart with Allah. You filled your heart with intent. I want to please you, Ya Rabb. And now this brings me to the last point I would like to cover today. Right? We spoke about, we know why we exist. We want to go back to Jannah, the purpose in life, what our goal is, where you're trying to head and how to do that smartly by adding an intention. No, I might have put some of you to sleep, but please wake up, listen to this coming point. It's very important to Allah. If there's anything I want to walk away with today, it's what I'm about to say right now. There are two very, very important points that you need to remove from your heart and your mind. Two things that have been deeply engraved, unfortunately, especially into the minds of our youth, and it has impacted us as well as adults. Number one, getting engulfed into the ideology of it's all about me, my success, my achievements, my this, my that, and forgetting that the message of Islam is a communal message that every single one of you, including myself, has the responsibility of bearing it and delivering it. Right? And number two, being afraid or being afraid of being identified as a Muslim. I'm going to touch on both topics again, two points really quickly. These are the two things you need to remove. First of all, the idea of me, myself, and I. It is the absolute contrary of what the Prophet وسلم, came by, came with. Right? If you think about it, he, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'm sorry, came as a mercy to all mankind. To every single person. Right? He wanted to deliver this message to every person who tread on this earth. His continuous du'a for those of his time, for those who came after him, for us, and for those who will come after us till the day that we meet him, the care, the love, the concern is the biggest proof of the communality of this message. And what we today in 2023 have to do with it. And I'm going to give you a quick example from the Quran. The story of Prophet Sulaiman and the ant. You all know the story? You're right? Okay, good. Now, Sayyidina Sulaiman was granted unbelievable wealth, power, abilities that were never given to any human being ever. The ability to control the wind so that he could travel at extreme speeds and to communicate with the jinn and to utilize them to do good. And you know how he was able to work with copper and utilize them in making weapons and basins and understand the animals and the birds. He's the wealthiest man that ever tread on earth. You guys all know Elon Musk. And Jeff Bezos, like my son says, like Bezos, mom, it's Bezos or something like that, <laughs> right? And how they're like worth 120 billion something. Nothing compared to Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salam's wealth. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him wealth. Actually, he didn't ask for the wealth. He was Abd Shakur. He thanked Allah in a way that Allah just kept giving him more. Why? Because he wanted to utilize whatever he was given, not to fulfill his you know, personal desires, let me just go to the Bahamas and they go here. No, no. Yeah, you could do that, but I'm not cheating anymore. I see somebody smiling in the back. It's okay, you can go to the Bahamas. But anyway, but because he felt responsible towards this message, and he knew with wealth and power, he could convey this message to places where no other human being could reach. But that sense of response, you think about it, people when they're rich, yeah, they'll give a little bit here there, but that's it, class. They go on how to, you know, they work on how to increase their wealth. They're not invested in the ummah. 
And this responsibility doesn't just end with Sayyidina Sulaiman. I want you to look at the end. You know the end that when we see kind of like walking and we like, and it's not Allah it's gone, it's dead. You shouldn't do that, you should take it outside. I want you to look at this end. Picture with me Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salam and his huge army, this huge army marching towards the end. Little tiny end. I mean, you think to yourself, if you were standing there, what would have you done? I'm gonna run for your life. If I need to get myself out of here, I need to save me. We're gonna be in flight mode. You're not going to think to yourself, uh, wait a minute, you know, who am I gonna warn? What should I do? You're not gonna think like that. The sense of responsibility towards others, it doesn't matter who they are, what they believe in or they don't believe in, it doesn't matter. That tiny, minute end carried itself in a more dignified way than most of us unfortunately would do today. That tiny ant gave its back to Sayyidina Sulaiman's army and it faced tiny ant, right? Turn a picture with me, the army, ant, turned around facing its community and it started saying the words, Ya ayyuhan nablu tkulu masakinakum la yakhtamunakum Sulaiman wa junudu wa hum la yashorun. Oh ants, enter your dwellings so that Sulaiman and his army or soldiers would not crush you while they're not aware. That is the kind of responsibility we need to start embracing as Muslims in the West. And it's not just your religious responsibility, yes, rather a sense of responsibility towards others that emerges from your religion. Even if it's simple as bringing someone's attention that they dropped something or they left their car lights on, show people that you care, right? We need more of Sayyidina Sulaiman's ants. Wallahi, we need more of Sayyidina Sulaiman's ants to care for people, genuinely care for people, even if you know your voice might not be heard. This is an ant. Can you imagine, guys? Like, really try to picture this. An ant addressing her community. SubhanAllah. This deen is such a beautiful deen. And there's nothing for you to be ashamed of or afraid of. And this brings me to point two, where we need to remove from our hearts and our minds fear, right? I truly believe that over the past years, we've been groomed to have that fear instilled in us. We're always worried, we're afraid. Walking down with my hijab, going through security, I'm worried, what's gonna happen? Right or wrong? Girls, maybe you can relate more. Boys, with your beards, you could go as a Muslim, you could go as a Hindu, you could go as a Buddha, you could go as one of those guys who are all about the new beards and the look with the hair on the side. You can get away with it somehow. Us, there's, there's no way out. A Muslim is a Muslim. You're identified through your hijab. We have come to a point where, as they say in Arabic, you know, walk next to the wall. You don't want to be noticed, right? We don't want to stand out. We don't want to be identified as people of faith, as Muslims. One main concern that we all have now is you just want to fit in. You want to be accepted. You don't want to stand out. And this is so wrong, Wallahi, because your religion should make you want to stand out. You should stand out. You should shine brightly with the teachings of this Islam, with the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. You should be able to walk holding your head up high, not with arrogance, but with pride for being a human being who cares about others, who genuinely cares about others and wants to bring good about, and to convey a message, and you know, you should know you're on the haq. You're upon the truth, there's nothing to be afraid of. Sometimes we are so afraid of what people are going to say, or how they might react, to the point that we actually disable ourselves from doing any good, or speaking out, or sharing with others, even if it's just among friends, what my belief, or you know, says, or what I believe in. And it even happens to us as adults, by the way. And I'm gonna share with you a final story, because I know my time is running out. So about a couple of years ago, I was being a good mom. At least I think I was. My kids didn't think that. I signed them up for a program called the Toastmasters, right? It was on Saturdays, every Sunday, Saturday morning at 8.30. They hated me for it. Um, but anyway, so it basically teaches them how to do public speaking. And what happens is that in each group, every week someone is assigned to be the master of the group, and he goes up on the stage and he kind of, you know, runs the whole program. Whoever's presenting comes up, he shakes hand with that person, and they go ahead and they present. So one time I picked up my kids and my son, who was maybe nine or ten at that time, very little, he looks very unhappy. And I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, I'm going to be the Toastmaster next week. 
was like, well, that's exciting, mashallah. He's like, but I have to shake hands with everybody who goes up on the stage. I'm like, okay, so what's the problem? He's like, well, there's a lot of girls in the class, and I don't feel like doing that. I was like, okay, what do I do with this one? So I was like, okay, alhamdulillah that he's feeling that way. That's what he sees everybody around him doing and his shaykh is doing. But what am I going to go and tell the teachers? He's a nine-year-old. He's a little kid, like literally. And I was, you know, I went back and forth and I was like, you know what? If this is how he feels, this is his natural inclination, his fitra, why am I going to force my son to do something that eventually he's not going to do? He's not going to shake hands. And so I just kind of manned up. I let that fear into me. And I went with him and I was like, boy, this is gonna be interesting. I went up to his teacher, she was Indian. I was like, you know, good morning, da da da, this is that. You know, my son is the Toastmaster today, but he does not, you know, feel comfortable shaking hands. He's not required yet to do this in our religion, but that's what he sees his teachers doing and what he's going to eventually do. And usually we kind of just, you know, leave her nod ahead or something like that, just a gesture of respect. And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I really can't do anything about that. You're gonna to have to speak to the head of the whole program. I was like, oh, come on, okay. <laughs> and I was like, where is he? And she points to the corner. This white, white, white guy, not judging anybody, Allah. And he was really mad, he was yelling at someone. I was like, oh boy, Aisa, can we just miss today's class? I'm thinking in my head. And I was like, you know, what's the worst case scenario? He's gonna tell me no? Okay, khalas, Aisa doesn't have to attend class today. And so I walked up to him and he's like, just one moment, please. I was like, okay. And then I started explaining to him, you know, in our religion, we don't usually shake hands with the opposite gender. My son is not yet required, but he doesn't feel comfortable, and I don't want to force him to do something against his fitra. And the man, wallahi, this happened, he's like, I am so sorry, I had no idea. Next time I see a Muslim woman, I will not put my hand out and embarrass her. I will just give her a nod of the head like you said. And it didn't end there, wallahi, I look next to me, the lady, the Indian lady who was next to me, her eyes are filled with tears. And then I look at her and she hugs me. And I'm like, what's going on? She, I was like, what happened? And she's like, thank you for reminding me that I have to speak up as well for my beliefs. Back home, when an elder walks in, we are supposed to bow down and kiss their feet. But I never do that because I'm so worried what people are going to think of my faith. It's so important to break away that fear. Don't be afraid. You don't know how people are going to react. Wallahi, you don't know. So many people out there who have misconceptions, and if you just put into your head, they're a khalq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just like you do, give them a chance, explain to them. You have no idea what their reactions are, but share more stories that I don't know what my time is looking like. Do I have any time? I'm done, I'm past my time, huh? Long time ago. <laughs> okay, but I'll tell you something. Even if you have that fear, Wallahi, my best bit of advice is to educate yourself. Go take a class. I was just discussing with someone right over here. Learn about the misconceptions in Islam. Ikna always has these classes with Dr. Sabil Ahmed, I believe. Misconceptions. Learn what these things are because people will come and ask you. Don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. So quickly, let me wrap up before I get kicked off the stage, right? First of all, don't forget that you have two hearts. A physical heart and a spiritual heart. See what you're good at and keep coming through it to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try to try to enter through new doors. Take an intention for everything and change your adat to ibadat. Change your habits into acts of worship. Remember, this deen is communal. It's not just me, myself, and I. Be like the ant. Remind yourself, put it down there. I'm going to be like that ant. And be proud of who you are. Don't let your fear hinder you from reaching out to others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you, preserve your hearts and your minds, and give you the ability to be confident and grounded in your faith, and to go out there and deliver the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have loved to witness you today, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.